Amen. Amen. All right. Good evening, church. We have a very special guest for you today. He taught this morning um, at our 8 and 10 o'clock service. His name is Dr. Jason Lyle from the Biblical Science Institute. It was amazing this morning, and he's going to talk about some of the resources he has over at the table, but we definitely want to encourage you before you leave to check it out. Also know that tomorrow morning at 8.30 a.m., we want to encourage you to show up if you want to show up because he's doing something for the school and the whole church is invited. We're going to keep it exactly like this. And so we would love to have you show up if you're able to do that. It's going to be a different one than you heard this morning and a different one than you heard tonight. So it will be a blessing. So everyone, let's all welcome Dr. Jason Lyle. All right, well, it's very good to be back with you this evening, and I get to talk about dinosaurs, because that's just fun, right? And dinosaurs are one of those um, icons of evolution. They're, they're something that evolutionists use that just kind, of, uh, just kind of to summarize their whole position. They don't even make an argument for it. They're like, oh, you believe in creation? Well, what about dinosaurs? Checkmate, right? Well... Dinosaurs are compatible with what the Bible says, and the Bible does have something to say about this topic. But the secular world likes to use misinformation about dinosaurs, really, to try and persuade people of millions of years of evolution. A lot of times they'll just tell a story that, you know, millions of years ago the dinosaurs evolved and then this happened, et cetera, et cetera. And we, we go and we see, you know, movies like Jurassic Park and Jurassic World, and they're very entertaining but they're based on secular ideas about how dinosaurs came to be. And I wanna show you that the Bible has a much better answer for that. And you can use the truth about dinosaurs to share the gospel. And I can't think of a better use of dinosaurs than to share the gospel. So, we probably should start by defining our terms. What are dinosaurs? You probably know they're reptiles. They're land reptiles, okay? Now, we're also gonna talk about creatures that swam in the Earth's oceans, like plesiosaurs, and flying reptiles, like pterodactyls, because they're also really cool, but technically they're not dinosaurs. Dinosaurs, by definition, are land reptiles, but they're different from modern living uh, land reptiles in two ways. Uh, first of all, they tended to have large holes in their skulls, besides just the, the you know, eye sockets, but they, that was perhaps to reduce weight on some of the larger ones anyway. But the main characteristic that all dinosaurs have and no modern reptiles have is the structure of their back legs. Of course, some dinosaurs are bipedal but, and some walked on all fours, but their back legs were different from modern reptiles. Modern reptiles, all modern reptiles, if they have legs, uh, of course, we have snakes, which have no legs, but if they have legs, their legs are out to the side in a sprawling position. Think of it like a crocodile or an alligator. You've seen how they, they can't get more than the foot off the ground because that's the way they're built. And that's a very good structure if you want to make a very quick lunge on something. It's not really good for long distance running. You can imagine trying to run a long way like that. It wouldn't be very effective. Dinosaurs had their legs underneath their bodies, kind of like ours, really. And there's a couple of different ways their hips are structured, and therefore there are two uh, broad categories of dinosaurs. But, but the point is, their leg structure was different from that of any living reptile. So they're a different class of reptile, and there's, and there's many different uh, kinds of dinosaurs. We'll talk about that. But some people ask, you know, is it just like a lizard that got big? Is that a dinosaur? No, they're a, they're a, they're a different uh, category of reptiles because their structure's different. Now, when we look at dinosaurs, just as when we look at any topic, we can look at it, uh, we look at it from a worldview, a way of thinking about things, which you can think of like a mental lens. And ultimately, the two most popular ways to look at dinosaurs would be from the perspective of either the Bible or, more commonly, the secular worldview. And when my secular colleagues look at dinosaur fossils and study them, they already have some beliefs People like to think that, well, scientists come to the evidence neutrally without any preconceptions. Well, that's, that's baloney. That does, that's not the case. Uh, we all have a way of thinking about the world, and that affects the conclusions that we draw from the evidence. Uh, secular scientists already have a belief about how the world came to be, millions of years of evolution, and so on. And so when they look at dinosaur fossils, they have that in their mind, and that helps, helps them to form conclusions about the fossils that they're looking at conclusions, many of which I think are wrong, because I disagree with their worldview. I don't agree, disagree with the fossils, I disagree with their interpretation of them. 
Uh, as a Christian, I look at the fossils from the perspective that God's word is true from the beginning. And the Bible gives us the true history of the universe, and it is an actual history. The e evolution is, an, is not a history, it's a story about the past made up by people who were not there. The Bible is the true history of the universe written by eyewitnesses and inspired by God. So, yeah. So that's the one we want to start with. You start with the Bible, you get better answers. Yeah. So the Bible gives us uh, what we call the seven seas of history. That's just kind of a nice way to remember the, the major events that have happened in Earth's history in terms of our relationship with God. So we start with creation, where God made a perfect world, a world that he called very good. It didn't remain that way for very long because God gave Adam dominion over that world and gave Adam the choice to either obey or disobey. Adam chose freely to disobey God. And that, then we have the second C, corruption. The world was cursed, rightly, because of Adam's sin. Now we have death and, and suffering in the world because of that sin. That's what sin does. It ruins paradises. Uh, then we have catastrophe, where the wickedness of mankind became so great that God chose to, to judge the earth and end all of mankind, except for Noah, who found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He and his family, his wife, his sons, and their wives, uh, they found uh, safety on board the ark, along with two of every air-breathing land animal on that ark. So uh, that's a reminder that God is righteous and he will judge sin because of that righteousness, you see. Only a corrupt judge would let a sin go unpunished, right? Then there's confusion. There's the confusion of tongues that took place at the Tower of Babel, where again mankind rebelled against God. It wasn't that very long after the flood, actually, where again people thought that they could go against their creator. And God split them up, accordingly confused the languages, and we think that's responsible for the base language groups that we find in the world today. Languages have diversified a bit since then. Then we have Christ, God himself steps into history. Yeah, something that had been promised back in Genesis 3, that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent, indicating that one of Eve's descendants would destroy Satan's power. And that, of course, is Christ, God himself stepping into history, taking our place on the cross, and, uh, and that, of course, will lead to the seventh sea, which has yet to happen in its fullness anyway, the consummation, the new heavens and the new earth. There's a sense in which that's already begun, because if you're in Christ, you are a new creation, right? But we haven't seen the fullness of that yet. So that one has um, yet to happen in its entirety. The world uh, will once again be a paradise, and those who are forgiven and our, and our nature changed to be like Christ can enter into that without, without ruining it like we did the original. When I look at dinosaur fossils, when my creationist scientist colleagues look at dinosaur fossils, that's the view of history we have in mind. And that helps us to interpret uh, the data and, and to do it correctly. Now granted, once, once we leave the, the inspired word of scriptures, there's, the, there's always the possibility of error. But by starting with the scriptures, but with starting with, by starting with something that's absolutely certain, we minimize uh, the errors. We can draw very good conclusions. So you've heard of like virtual reality glasses that let you see what's not there. I like to think of the Bible as biblical reality glasses. It lets you see what is there. It gives you the true view of the universe. And we should think in terms of scripture in, in everything that we do. And um, you know, I'm, I'm realizing how, how far I still have to go in that area. Uh, we need to take captive every thought into obedience to Christ. And we, when we do that, um, it's, it's just we, we receive blessings from the Lord. It's just a very good thing. So put on your biblical reality glasses and let's see if, what we can conclude about dinosaurs. We can conclude, for example, that dinosaurs are made on day six of the creation week. Uh, those of you that were with us this morning, we talked about how God made in six days and how those are ordinary days because of the... Hebrew language and the context there. Dinosaurs are made on day six because they're land animals by definition, right? That's, uh, dinosaurs are land animals. That's part of the definition of being a dinosaur. Land animals, according to scripture, were made on day six along with people. And therefore, dinosaurs were made on day six. So they did live at the same time as, as people. How about that? You don't hear that in the secular universities, but it's true. And, and, we, and that's just a very basic form of logic. That's a syllogism, okay? And so we know that because everything that creeps upon the earth, everything that's a land animal, God made on day six of the creation week. And you can read about that in Genesis 1, 24 through 25. So dinosaurs are not millions of years old. Nothing is, by the way. They did live alongside people. And that really bothers folks because, again, we've seen Jurassic 
park movies and it doesn't work out so well when dinosaurs are with people, right? But, but we tend not to see that in, in, like, in, in biblical children's books, the Garden of Eden, uh, you, you tend not to see dinosaurs, but Adam and Eve would have known about dinosaurs and they would have been peaceful creatures. Why? Because God saw everything he had made and behold, it was very good. Yeah, which means dinosaurs would have been very good originally. You mean even T-Rex? Even T-Rex. Yes. There's another way you could know that these dinosaur fossils are not millions of years old, and that's because death came into the world after Adam sinned, right? So they, dinosaurs couldn't have been dying millions of years, 65 million years before Adam was even around, because the, the world was very good. It wasn't until Adam sinned that death entered that world, and God even uh, instituted animal death at that point to provide skins of clothing for Adam and Eve. People get intimidated because they think, well, the scientists can tell how old fossils are because apparently they come with labels when you dig them up. Well, they don't, right? I mean, you might have seen in natural history museums dinosaur fossils with labels attached, 65 million years old. But my point is they didn't come that way. They were attached by someone who was not around when the fossil formed and therefore does not actually know the age of it. And I'm happy to talk about radiometric dating and things like that. We'll do some of that tomorrow, actually, if you're able to come. But um, is there scientific evidence that dinosaurs lived recently and not millions of years ago? Oh, yes. What would you think if we found blood cells from a creature? Would you think, well, that probably died hundreds of millions of years ago? Well, I got news for you. We have found in, in uh, some dinosaur remains soft tissue, things like you know, uh, muscle and flesh, and even uh, blood vessels with blood cells still in them we found that a lot of dinosaur fossils are fossilized. Maybe I should explain. Fossilization is where um, minerals have moved in and filled in all the holes in a, in, a, in a bone. Bones are porous, which keeps them nice and light. Minerals will fill them in, turn them into stone, basically. But we found that a lot of times when you dissolve away the outer portion of a dinosaur fossil, inside, it's still fresh. In fact, these, um, that, that uh, blood vessel that you see in the left panel it's still stretchy. You can still stretch it. And, those, and you're seeing uh, red blood cells there in the panel on the right. You can see they're nucleated because reptiles have nucleated blood cells. So dinosaurs did apparently. And that's from a T-Rex femur. That's not millions of years old. And I think it's wonderful. It was by uh, God's divine providence. It was an evolutionist that discovered that. Because if a creationist discovered it, they'd say, no way. That's a hoax. You're making that up but it was an evolutionist that discovered it. Now, we've discovered many other cases since then, but I think that's fascinating. So dinosaurs did live recently. Did they evolve? Well, according to scripture, nothing evolved in the sense of one kind becoming a different kind you know, generationally over a long period of time. God has built in with animals the ability to diversify. And so you can get different breeds of dogs from just two and so on, and dinosaurs are the same way but they didn't, they didn't change from one kind to another. And you can see this even in the evolutionary literature if they're honest about it, when they'll show, um, you know, this is supposed to be the dinosaur family tree. It's supposed to, the, the branching is supposed to be dinosaur, one kind changing into another and, and, and so on, with the oldest one being down at the bottom. So a Thecodont ancestor is supposed to be down here. And then all the dinosaurs have evolved from that, allegedly. And this again is from an evolutionist textbook. But it's, they're honest enough to admit, to admit that highlighted areas indicate solid fossil evidence. So all the, all the areas that you see that are highlighted in that light blue, those are the places where they actually find fossils with how far down, um, which, uh, how far down in the geologic column we find and which evolutionists believe represents a long time. I reject that. But my point is, this is where you find the fossils. Where is all the branching, the evolution happening? All the places where you don't find fossils. That's oddly inconvenient, right? For some reason, dinosaurs have gone to great pains to hide all of the transitions between the major kinds. Either that or there aren't transitions between the major kinds, which would be consistent with the data. So there's no evidence for dinosaur evolution, not at all. Variation within a kind, certainly, but not one kind changing to another, it's not there. Okay, what did dinosaurs eat? There's a question, right? Think about T-Rex, for example. What's he thinking about eating? What's on the menu? Something like that. Of course, now we know that humans lived with dinosaurs, so maybe, maybe it was Adam on the menu? Oh. What do you think? Let's consider Tyrannosaurus rex, who had teeth up to six inches long, ooh, with a serrated edge. Wow. How would the first T-Rex 
The first T-Rex that God made had been described. Would he have been a plant eater, a meat eater, a scavenger, or a plant and meat eater? How many say plant eater? Okay, a few. How many say meat eater? Okay, how many say scavenger? How many say plant and meat eater? Okay. Now, a number of you didn't vote. You deserve the government you get. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, the first would have been a plant eater. Yeah. Now, how do I know that? It's something that scripture records. In Genesis 1, 29 and 30, God speaking to Adam and Eve, God said, see, I've given you every green herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food. God gave plants to Adam and Eve to eat. Verse 30, also to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air, to everything that creeps on the earth, would that include dinosaurs? Are they part of everything that creeps on the earth? Yes, everything's part of everything that creeps on the earth, right. In which there's life, I've given every green herb for food. And it was so. Those first dinosaurs ate plants. And, the first, and by the way, human beings also originally were vegetarian. Now, if you had a hot dog for lunch, that's okay. Because you read a little further in scripture, in Genesis 9, after the flood, God gave permission for human beings, at least, to eat meat, right? God says, you know, just as I gave you the plants, now I give you everything that moves on the earth, which is kind of what a hot dog is. So um, you're okay now. But originally human beings and all animals would have eaten plants. Yes, that first T-Rex would have been vegetarian. And boy, does that bother people because they're like, well, I've seen Jurassic Park and I know what T-Rex eats. He eats lawyers, right? Well, but that's not what the Bible indicates. And people get bothered by those sharp teeth, but hey, you can delve right into plants, right? I mean, in, in, you know, indeed, T-Rex had incredibly sharp teeth with a six inch with a serrated, serrated edge, perfectly designed for ripping and tearing into watermelons and cantaloupes and all sorts of plants. Because if you think about it, there are many plants that, that require something sharp to get into. We think of a watermelon, that's about the softest plant you can think of, but to get to the soft stuff on the inside, you gotta cut through that hard exterior. We use something like a sharp knife, kinda like a sharp tooth, to get in there. Oh yeah, but T-Rex could bite right into one and it wouldn't be a problem. Not a problem at all. And by the way, there are animals today that have very sharp teeth that are either entirely or primarily vegetarian, like this particular primate who is mostly vegetarian, only occasionally supplementing his diet with meat, and yet he's got sharp teeth. Uh, this particular uh, primate here, look at the sharp teeth on that guy. He's a vegetarian. He eats grass. Yeah, the only meat he would eat would be occasionally insects. So isn't that interesting? Just because something has sharp teeth doesn't mean it has to eat meat. This particular skull, you might think, well, look at the sharp teeth on that guy. He's got to be a meat eater. Well, we know what this guy eats because this species is still alive today. This is the skull of a fruit bat. What do you think a fruit bat eats? Fruit, yeah, it's not a trick question, yeah. <laughs> now, obviously, at some point after sin, some animals started eating meat because some of them eat meat today, right? And we don't, the Bible doesn't give us a lot of details on that. It's primarily written about people for people, right? Uh, it gives us a little information on animals, but not a lot. We don't know exactly when they started eating meat, but we do know that some animals are meat eaters. But I think it's interesting that even animals that we tend to think of as meat eaters, like lions, meat eaters, right? They will occasionally go back to their pre-fall diet. They will occasionally go vegetarian. There, and we know this because we've seen it happen. There was this example of little tyke. She's a 350-pound female lion, lived her whole life in captivity, very peaceful creature. There she is with one of, her, one of her owners. And she went her whole life without ever eating meat. Now, they'd try to give her meat because everybody knows that lions need meat to live, right? But you can see she turns away from it. She doesn't even like the smell of meat. She doesn't like it. She does like milk, however. So, so she's not vegan. But um, yeah, isn't that interesting? And she would occasionally eat eggs as well. But meat, she wouldn't touch it. And that's interesting because, you know, the, the prophet Isaiah prophesied of a time in his future when some carnivorous animals would go back to their pre-fall diet. And he mentions lions specifically in Isaiah 11:7, The lion shall eat straw like the ox. Isaiah 65, 25, the lion shall eat straw like the bullock. This was prophesied in scripture. And we've now seen it happen. That's interesting. And we might just be seeing the beginning of that. We might see more of that to come. So all the information we've learned so far about dinosaurs would apply to anything that's, that's a land animal. All land animals were made on day six. All of them were vegetarian and so on. But people wonder, why is it we don't find a specific mentions of dinosaur 
dinosaurs in the Bible? Why don't we find the word dinosaur in the Bible? And there's a very good reason for that. The word dinosaur is a modern word. It was invented in 1841 by Sir Richard Owen, who was a creationist, by the way. And the word kind of means terrible lizard. But, um, but, but see, the Bible, the King James Version, was translated back in 1611. The word dinosaur did not exist when the Bible was translated into English. There were some earlier English translations as well. But of course you're not gonna find that word. It didn't exist yet. You won't find the word email in scripture either. It didn't, it didn't exist at the time, right? But you will find the word dragon in many translations of scripture. And the Hebrew word that is translated dragon is tanin. And it's really interesting. This, this, uh, when you study these, these instances of tanin in scripture, and there, there's a number of examples of where this word is found in scripture. You can look these up later if you like. But um, these are apparently uh, monstrous creatures, either reptiles or sometimes maybe other very large creatures like whales. It's kind of a generic term. But it would certainly include dinosaurs. Dinosaurs would certainly be uh, part of the tanin uh, category. What about specific, specific kinds of dinosaurs? I think they're mentioned, but keep in mind, they will not have a modern name, right? They'll be called by whatever the people at that time called them. And we read about creatures that sound for all the world like dinosaurs. Like in Job chapter 40, beginning in verse 15, we read about a creature called behemoth. That's the, they actually left that untranslated. That's a Hebrew word, behemoth. It kind of means beast of beasts. It's just an amazing creature, and we'll read the description of it here in just a moment, and I think you'll find that it, it, it fits one of these long-necked uh, dinosaurs, the sauropodomorphs, that had the long neck and the, and the long tail, and were very big. They were the largest land animals, as far as we know. And so that's, uh, that's interesting. Now, it's always good to look at the context, right? Job is considered a poetic book because the speeches of Job and his friends are poetic in nature, but... But it's really recording history. It's just that the history it's re recording includes lots of poetically delivered speeches. Uh, you remember the story, of course. Job is uh, being uh, tried by God for his benefit, ultimately, in the long run. And uh, Job, it, we talk about the patience of Job. He never cursed God to his credit. But he was getting a little impatient toward the end, and we can hardly blame him. I don't think any of us would do any better. But Job wanted to have a conversation with God. And God, in his mercy, answered Job, beginning in chapter 38. And he said, okay, Job, but before we can have a conversation, let's see if you're qualified. Let's see if you can reason with me. And then God begins asking a series of questions to Job that Job cannot answer. And some of the things that God mentions are certain animals that he's created. And he's wondering if, if Job can contend with these animals. These are all real animals that he created. And he builds up, they, they get more and more impressive until he builds up to the behemoth in, ch in chapter 40, verse 15. So my point is, this would have to be a real animal that Job was familiar with. Otherwise, God's argument would not make sense. God's basically pointing out, you can't even deal with one of my creatures. What makes you think you can deal with me? If it was a fictional animal, God's argument would make no sense. So this is a real animal that apparently Job had seen. And when we read the description of it, it sounds like one of these uh, long-necked dinosaurs. Look now at Behemoth, which I made along with you. He eats grass like an ox. So it's an herbivore, even at this time in history. It, it apparently had remained an herbivore even at uh, the time of Job. Job, we think, was written around 2000 BC. He lived, we think, at around the same time as Abraham, actually. Uh, so he eats grass like an ox, and indeed, these uh, large um, uh, sauropodomorphs, they ate grass. By the way, uh, evolutionists for a long time said, well, they, they pondered how they could possibly get enough nutrients in because they thought grass hadn't evolved yet because grass is found in higher layers than these creatures. Interesting. Uh, but since then, they found grass in the stomachs of these creatures, so they did eat grass. The Bible's right about that. Verse 16 says, see now his strength is in his hips and his power is in his stomach muscles. So, uh, and, and indeed, uh, like a Diplodocus, for example, had very strong muscles along its stomach that were necessary to support its long neck and its long tail. Verse 17, for me, is the clincher. It says, he moves his tail like a cedar. That's a tree. So when this thing moves its tail, it's like moving a cedar tree. And that indeed would be a good description of one of these long necked long-tailed dinosaurs. Uh, verse 18, his bones are like beams of bronze, his ribs like bars of iron. 
He's the first of the ways of God, perhaps indicating he's the most impressive land creature that God made. And indeed, we think this, these sauropodomorph dinosaurs were the largest land animal that God created. The largest animal God created is not a land animal. It's the blue whale. And they're still alive. Verse 19. Okay, so he's the first of the ways of God. Only he who made him can bring near his sword. That's a little, that reads a little awkwardly in English, but it's basically saying only God could attack this creature. If you come at it with a sword, it's going to bat you away with its tail, and that's the end of you. Okay? Now, some Bibles in the footnotes, you know, they have behemoth and they'll have a little footnote and they'll say, you know, possibly an elephant or hippopotamus. I don't think the description fits an elephant or hippopotamus. Uh, for one thing, do they have a tail like a cedar tree? Does an elephant have a tail like a cedar tree? Not at all. It has a tail like a little rope, right? Doesn't fit. Does a hippopotamus have a tail like a cedar tree? Not at all. It has a tail like a little flat. It's, I mean, nothing could be further from that. I mean, you could imagine an elephant or a hippo with a tail like a cedar tree. That's not going to work. That's not going to work. So I don't know for sure that behemoth is a dinosaur. I know it's not an elephant or a hippo because the description does not fit. In the next chapter in Job, we read about one of these swimming creatures, which being an ocean creature could not be a true dinosaur, but it could be something like a plesiosaur where they had the four flippers and the long neck. Some of them had long necks. And we re read the description. Again, it's monstrous, whatever it is. And again, Leviathan, that's the original Hebrew word. It's left untranslated. Uh, verse 1, can you draw Leviathan with a hook or snare his tongue with a line which you lower? God's asking a rhetorical question. Can you fish this thing out like you would catfish? No, of course not. Verse 9, indeed, any hope of overcoming him is false. Shall one not be overwhelmed at the sight of him? Verse 10, no one is so fierce that would dare stir him up. Who then is able to stand against me? You see the argument that God's making there? You can't even deal with one of my creatures that you're terrified of this thing that I made what makes you think you can argue with me, right? You see the argument there. Verse 15, his rows of scales are his pride. So it's a scaly creature, it's a reptile. Um, one, one is so near another that no air can come between them. Verse 22, strength dwells in his neck, sorrow dances before him. Strength dwells in his neck, that's interesting. It made me think of one of these long-necked uh, plesiosaurs, like an elasmosaurus, for example. There were several different varieties. Verse 25, when he raises himself up, the mighty are afraid because of his crashing, they're beside themselves. Apparently, this animal could raise itself up, kind of come out of the water, and it, plesiosaurs, we think, could do that with their long, long neck and their, the little head at the end of it. Uh, verse 33, on earth there is nothing like him which is made without fear. Whatever this thing was, it was terrifying. It was terrifying. And I didn't even read all the verses. Some of the verses indicate that uh, sparks leap out of its mouth and smoke goes out of its nostrils. And people say, oh, come on. Not, not only is it a dragon, it's a fire-breathing dragon. That's got to be fictional. And then, of course, my follow-up question is why? Why? Can you give me a scientific basis why God couldn't create an animal that could do something like produce flame? Because, by the way, he has done that in other organisms. There's a creature called a bombardier beetle that mixes a couple of chemicals in its abdomen along with a catalyst and it's able to produce a hot spray to protect it from predators. There's no reason why God couldn't do that on a larger scale with a larger animal. We, we, the chemistry's already there. There's lots of animals that have amazing abilities that if you hadn't seen it in action, you might find it hard to believe. Think of an electric eel. If you just found the fossil skeleton of an electric eel, would you ever know that it could produce electricity? Would that ever even occur to you to think that it could do that? We gotta be careful when we just find fossils of these things thinking that we know everything about them. But apparently, these creatures could actually produce something like a flame. Now again, some Bibles in the footnotes will say, you know, uh, Leviathan, possibly a crocodile. The description does not fit that of a crocodile. Verse 25, when he raises himself up, can a crocodile raise himself up? He can't get more than a foot off the ground because he's got that sprawling gait. This is obviously an animal that has some kind, apparently a long neck that could raise himself up. And people saw these things. And when you look at ancient maps, people like to think that the reason that, that ships didn't go very far away from the coastline is because people thought the world was flat and they'd fall off. That's not the case. People have known the world is round since 500 BC. What do you see on ancient maps? Dragons, right? And they couldn't, they couldn't keep track of uh, longitude very well either. So. so these were real animals. What about flying reptiles? Does the Bible mention those? 
It does, explicitly. Isaiah 14, 29 mentions a fiery flying serpent. Serpent would be the ancient word for reptile, and this is a fiery flying reptile. The word for fiery can either mean uh, vividly colorful or it can mean, uh, bur- it has this like a burning uh, connotation to it. And so it can either mean vividly colorful or poisonous. Either one might apply. Uh, Isaiah 30, verse 6, the fiery flying serpent. The Hebrew word there is interesting. It's seraph, which is the singular form of seraphim, which is a class of angel. So that it's interesting. That same term is used for a physical flying reptile that's used for a class of angels, apparently. Quite fascinating. And it's, it, that word occurs in other places in Scripture. In fact, in some places where the, um, when the, you know, when the Israelites were encountering the plague of serpents, they kept getting bit and getting sick, and they had to make the bronze serpent. Remember that? And they had to look at it, and they'd be healed. Remember that account? Well, um, some of the words that's used for serpent there are nakash, which is just an ordinary snake, but sometimes they'll use the word seraph. So it might have been flying reptiles in addition to terrestrial snakes that they were dealing with. That's at least a possibility. It's very interesting. So... The Bible does talk about creatures that fit the description of dinosaurs. They're not going to use modern names, obviously, but, uh, and, and, and swimming reptiles like plesiosaurs, they're creatures that fit that description in Scripture, and they're flying reptiles in Scripture. There's no doubt about that. So that being said, people start to wonder then, well, then were dinosaurs on Noah's Ark? And would they fit? Right? Well, first of all, would they have been on Noah's Ark? Well... Genesis 7, 8, 9 of clean animals and animals that are not clean and birds and everything that creeps on the ground, that would include dinosaurs, right? There went into the ark to Noah by twos, male and female, as God had commanded Noah. So yes, they would have been on Noah's ark because they're land animals. And this is where the critics say, well, we got you here. There's no way you could possibly get dinosaurs on board Noah's ark. And that's partly because they don't realize how big Noah's ark was, but it's also because they haven't done the homework. Because if I, if, if any critic who says, well, you couldn't possibly get all those animals, you know, because it's not just dinosaurs. You had, Noah had to take two of every air-breathing land animal, seven of some, but there were relatively few clean kinds. That's a lot of animals. There's no way you could get all those animals on Noah's Ark. There's two questions you should ask the critic. One, do you know how big Noah's Ark was? And two, how many animals would go on board? And how much space would they take up? And you know, the funny thing is, you ask most critics who say, you can't possibly get all those animals on board Noah's Ark. You ask them how big was Noah's Ark. They don't know. Most of them. And it's not hard, because the scripture does give the dimensions. Um, how many animals would go on board? They don't know that either. Two of each kind, but how many is that? Are we talking thousands, millions, billions? How many? They don't know that either. Right? But they're just sure you can't get all those animals on board Noah's Ark. Now, my point is, that is not a logical objection, that you can't possibly fit an unknown number of animals on a boat of unknown size, right? (laughs) That is not a logical objection. Well, critics haven't done their homework. Um, I have. A lot of other creation scientists have. The the size of Noah's Ark is pretty easy. We can get that from scriptures. It's um, 300 cubits by uh, 50 by 30. A cubit is the distance from your elbow to the tip of your hand. That's a little different for different people. But uh, we think 18 inches would be sort of a reasonable minimum. The absolute minimum would be 17 and a half inches. This would be the smallest Noah's Ark could possibly have been. More realistically, it was 450 feet by 75 by 45. It was huge, three decks, massive. Why is it that children's books, when they depict Noah's Ark, inevitably look like this, right? They got all the animals jam-packed on there, they're all happy and smiling, even though the world's being destroyed. I never did quite get that. But that's not the Ark that the Bible describes. The Ark that the Bible describes has the same capacity as 522 railroad stock cars. That's a lot of capacity, a lot of capacity. You can imagine Noah's shock and disappointment if God told him to build this little bathtub thing. But no, God gave Noah the dimensions of the ark, possibly other information that's not recorded, but at the very least, he gave him the dimensions. And it was big. You see, little bathtub arcs would not survive a worldwide flood. The ark that God designed is designed to weather a worldwide flood. And we've had engineers that have studied it and say, you know, even the, the dimensions are right. If you, if you make it a little longer, a little shorter, it makes it either less stable or less seaworthy or more likely to capsize or less comfortable for the passengers, Noah's Ark is optimized. 
for the flood. How did they know how to do that? I mean, they didn't have the kind of computers we have today that can simulate that. It's almost as if they had some kind of divine insight into the issue, which of course they did. So Noah's Ark was big, very big, but was it big enough? How many animals, animals would have to go on board? And this is where there, there gets to be a little bit of confusion here because two of each kind, but a lot of people think that kind is the same as species. It really isn't, or that it's the same of breeds. My, my point is, we have, for example, lots of breeds of dogs today, but Noah didn't have to take two Dalmatians and two Beagles and two Kelpies and two Border Collies. He just had to take two dogs. You can get all those breeds later. Uh, those of you that are able to come to the second session tomorrow, I'll talk about the genetics of how that happens. But there's only, we think all dogs are related. There are two dogs on Noah's Ark, and they're all you can get all these different breeds later due to the genetic diversity God planted in the dog kind. They're still dogs, and that's what they're always going to be. They're never going to evolve into something else. But they do diversify. That's by God's plan. It's the same way with the dinosaurs. You don't need two triceratops, two eoceratops, two torosaurus, two pachyrhinoceros. You just need two of the ceratopsian kind. You can get all these different breeds later. You say, well, they're classified as different species. That's okay. But we, we think they're the same kind. We think they're part of the same family. And so although there are over 600 dinosaur names, and those of you that have young kids, they know all of them, right? Uh, there are only about 60 dinosaur kinds. That's, that's our best estimate for the, the uh, reproductive limit of a group of organisms. So there's the carnosaur kind, and there's the ceratopsian kind, and et cetera, et cetera, and chylosaur kind, and so on. And so there's only about 60 kinds of dinosaurs. So how many dinosaurs would be on Noah's Ark? Two of each kind, 60 kinds, 120. That's it, 120. Mammals, there's a lot of mammals on Noah's Ark, but not all mammals are on Noah's Ark. The blue whale didn't have to go on Noah's Ark because it's not a land animal, that's right. Birds, uh, reptiles, including the dinosaurs, you added up, we think there were less than 16,000 animals on board Noah's Ark. This is an estimate by John Wood Morappy that he did some years ago. I think it's a, one of the better estimates. And he, even he's being generous to the critics, he's sort of, this would be kind of an upper limit. People say, yes, but the dinosaurs were so big. And you need to remember, only some dinosaurs were big. Some dinosaurs never got bigger than a dog. Some never got bigger than a chicken, like little Compsognathus, that's all the bigger it got. Interesting. So there are very small varieties of dinosaur that apparently stayed small. The other thing you need to remember is even the largest Dinosaurs, the ones that you know, fill an entire room in a museum, they started out very small. Because the, the largest dinosaur eggs we find are a little bigger than a football. They're like that big. You mean that big sauropodomorph dinosaur with the long neck and the long tail? Yeah, it, it hatched out of an egg that big. Which means it must have been pretty small when it was a baby, right? And so given that the purpose of bringing two of every air-breathing land animal on board Noah's Ark was to preserve life so that they could go and reproduce, wouldn't it make sense for God to take maybe some of the younger dinosaurs, maybe young adults? Why would he take senior citizen dinosaurs on board, right? Why not some of the younger ones? Some reptiles can, um, will grow fairly rapidly to adulthood and then they'll grow at a slower rate thereafter as long as they live. Not all reptiles do that. We don't know if dinosaurs did that, but they may have in which case God could have taken some of the young adults, for the, at least for the big varieties, uh, so they would reproduce quickly after the flood. So there's lots of ways you can kind of minimize the uh, space that would be needed if you use your brain. And, uh, and God, of course, knew that. So the space available, 450 feet by 75, three decks, that gives you the square footage. Pretty big, pretty big. Space required, we can estimate that. Birds take up very little space because most of them are very small. Mammals take up the most space because there's the most of them. Reptiles, including the dinosaurs, 120 of those are dinosaurs, would have taken up less than 16% of the space on the ark for, the t for a total of 46%. So all the animals on board Noah's ark would have taken up less than half the space on Noah's ark when you do the math. And some estimates are even less than that. Some estimates are able to get it down to about a third, in which case you could put all the animals on one deck leaving a deck for Noah's sons to play football and a deck for Noah and Mrs. Noah to play shuffleboard. So there you go. Why, did the, why was there so much space left over? They had to put food on there, okay? And probably quite a bit of food because they, they had to bring some food for the animals and for themselves and anything else they wanted to take with them. And I think there was room for more people. 
The Bible says Noah was a preacher of righteousness. He was out there preaching, come on board the ark and be saved from the wrath to come. Now, God knew only eight people would, would heed that call, but Noah may not have known that. He might have prepared more rooms. We don't really know. But in any case, when you go through the math, you find that there's plenty of room on board Noah's ark for all of the uh, animals. And, so, and by the way, maybe there's, maybe there's some youngsters out there, because sometimes in the math class, they're like, when am I ever going to use this stuff? Here you go. Right? Because the critics can't do math. They make statements in, ig in ignorance. I can do the math, and I can say, actually, it's perfectly consistent with what the Bible teaches. So, so yeah, there's plenty of room on board Noah's Ark for the dinosaurs and all other air-breathing land animals. They would have got off Noah's Ark, which means dinosaurs actually survived the flood as kinds. Granted, 99.999% of all individuals in terms of land animals were destroyed in that flood, but there were representative kinds on board Noah's Ark that got off the Ark and reproduced, and so we might expect to find some legends of people encountering dinosaurs in history, right? Now, they're not going to be called dinosaurs. That's a modern word. They would be called dragons. That's the ancient word. Do we find legends of people encountering dragons in history? And the answer is, oh, yes. And if you think about even our modern conception of a dragon, um, it kind of combines the different varieties of dinosaurs, doesn't it? Kind of interesting. There's the legend of St. George and the dragon. That le now, you know, this is not in scripture. It wouldn't have to be true, but it could be entirely true. The legend is that there's a town that's being victimized by a dragon that's coming in and eating their livestock. The legend is that St. George rides in on his horse and kills the dragon and preaches Christianity, and they're very grateful, and many people convert. Um, again, it's not in the Bible, but it could be entirely true. We have found fossils of baryonyx in that part of England. They were found there in 1983. Marco Polo, in AD 1271, reported that the ch Chinese royal chariots were occasionally pulled by dragons. Apparently, at this time in history, dragons were relatively rare, and it was the thing to do if you were wealthy would be to raise your own dragons, because so, only wealthy people could afford to get them because they're so rare. We know from recorded history that in the year 1611, the Chinese emperor appointed the position of royal dragon feeder. That's in the documentation. There was a job where your job was to feed the dragons, which makes me think they probably had some. There's a city in France that was renamed in the honor of the killing of a dragon there. The animal is described as being larger than an ox, armored, and had horns on its head. Isn't that interesting? And it reminds us of the ceratopsian types, like perhaps a triceratops. Uh, this one's really well documented. There was a town, there's a town in Italy where there was a peasant who was walking behind his, his cart. His, his oxen were pulling a cart. He's kind of walking behind them at the moment. And they encountered this little hissing dragon on the road up ahead of them. It's small, but it's very brave. It's hissing at them. The oxen are afraid of it. They won't get close to it. And so this man, he has a, a, a staff with him, and he ends up hitting the creature on the head and killing it. And then he does something very smart. He brings the body in to a local scientist named Ulysses Eldervandus. And that's why we have such good records of this, because Ulysses Eldervandus carefully documented this creature. He said it was unlike any others he'd ever seen. And, uh, and uh, he said it was unquestionably a reptile. And for a while, he was even able to preserve it for, for a while anyway. But he described it so well, we think we know what species it was. We think it was a Tanistrophius. And again, that's on May 13th, 1572. Not millions of years ago, a few hundred years ago. Pretty interesting. So, and again, we have good documentation because a scientist uh, recorded all those details. So, if you ever encounter and kill a dinosaur, make sure you bring the body in to a local scientist so we can document it, okay? <laughs> What about flying reptiles? All kinds of uh, re uh, records of people seeing flying reptiles. This was not thought of as being absurd until, until recently, actually, but there are um, documents of flying reptiles uh, in Egypt, for example, and we think they're a Ramphorhynchus. Again, the descriptions are so specific, we think we know what species it was. Ramphorhynchus were relatively small, but they had a long tail, uh, which, which birds really don't. Uh, and then there's, there's the other type of flying reptile, the pterodactyloids, which had the huge wingspan, but they had a very small tail. We think these are ramphorhynchoids. And uh, Herodotus, in uh, book two, of course, Herodotus confirmed some of the events of the Bible, so he was a historian. And he found a place in Arabia, he says, where I went to learn about the winged serpents. He says, when I arrived there, I saw innumerable bones and backbones of serpents, many heaps of backbones, great and small and even smaller. 
So he finds a valley full of dead ramphrinkas, dead flying reptiles. He says, winged serpents are said to fly from Arabia at the beginning of spring, making for Egypt, but the ibis birds encounter the invaders in this pass and kill them. He further documents that the Egyptians worshipped the ibis birds for doing them the favor of killing these annoying ramphrinkas because apparently they were poisonous. You get bit by them and that wasn't a good thing. So they, they loved the fact that the ibis birds killed them. He goes on to say, the serpents are like water snakes. Their wings are not feathered, but very like the wings of a bat. Again, serpent, that's the ancient word for reptile. This is a scaly creature. He goes out of his way to say, it's not, it's not a bird, it's not a feathered creature. Its wings are like a bat, meaning like a membrane type material, like skin. So, uh, and, and by the way, the eyewitness reports of these go back 400 BC all the way up to 1600 AD, and then they stop. So we think we know when this went extinct, and it wasn't 65 million years ago. It was about 400 years ago. Really interesting. You'll also define depictions on certain ancient coins of reptiles, but with wings. So, kind of interesting. You might know that uh, people in the past sometimes lived in caves. That's one of the, the funny questions I get. You, do you believe in cavemen? Do you, do you believe men lived in caves? Well, well, yeah. The Bible says Lot lived in a cave for a little while, so yeah. That makes a lot of sense, right? You have a shelter that you don't have to build. It's already there for you. People lived in caves sometimes, and sometimes they would paint on the walls. I always thought it was the kids that did that. I don't really know that, but. And they would draw things like people and buffalo, and occasionally they would draw things that look for all the world like dinosaurs. Let me show you some examples of this. Here's a petroglyph of what appears to be a sauropod dinosaur. I'm sorry these don't show up very well on PowerPoint, so we've enhanced it for you on the right slide there so you can see the outline. But it really does look like one of these four-legged, long-necked, long-tailed creatures. Uh, here's another petroglyph in uh, Natural Bridges National Monument, Utah. Uh, I haven't seen it myself, but um, uh, friends of mine who have seen it say it's obvious when you're there. It's just, it's hard to photograph, but it's very, very easy to see. The long neck, the long tail, and the four legs. There are sculptures in France. These are uh, sometimes called salamanders, but they're clearly reptiles. And this is uh, well documented in Vance Nelson's book on, uh, on these creatures. And uh, so pretty neat. And some of them are fire breathing too. You can see flames going out. So apparently some animals could really do that. We, we know that, but we know from scripture that some animals could. And they, the, uh, these sculptures do match certain kinds of known, of known dinosaurs. So ancient tapestries that depict creatures that when you zoom in on them, it looks like a juvenile dinosaur, perhaps a, a myosaurus, for example. That's what we think they looked like. The, there are sculptures from China. This is thought to be 4,000 years old. This is thought to be date back to the time of around Abraham and Job. And this is long before we found dinosaur fossils. Dinosaur fossils weren't found until the 1800s. So apparently whoever carved this had seen the actual creature. And again, it looks like one of the ceratopsian kinds, a centrosaurus, perhaps a monoclonius. And uh, again, another sculpture also from China, also about 4,000 years old, matches like a protoceratops perhaps. Bishop Bell, Bishop Bell's tomb in Carlisle Cathedral. Now we know when this guy died, and it wasn't 65 million years ago, it was 1496, okay? And he was buried in Carlisle Cathedral, and that's the tomb, it's very elaborate, and there are brass strips along the sides and the top, and there used to be one along the bottom, but it has worn off over time because there's a carpet that goes over this, and people walk on the carpet apparently more along the bottom there. And so the bottom brass strip is kind of worn down. The other three, though, have animal carvings in them. I'll show you a few. Bats, dogs, fish, birds. They're a little stylized, but you can clearly tell what the animal is. And these are also on there. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. So there's a zoom in on one of them. So again, the long neck, long tail, four legs. We don't have animals like that anymore, but apparently they did at that time. There's a temple in Cambodia. Um, I think this goes back to 800, the year 800 AD, if memory serves. And it's got, uh, again, carvings on the side of human beings and animals. One of the animals that is, really strikes people as interesting, because it's got these plates along the back, and it reminds us of known kinds of uh, plated dinosaurs, like a stegosaurus, perhaps. The Australian Aborigines have a legend of a creature they believe, they believe it still lives in Lake uh, Galilee in uh, northern Queensland of Australia. And this is their painting of it. They call it Yaru. 
and apparently they've opened, apparently this was a dead one that had washed up and they've opened up the digestive tract and everything. It looks like a, it looks for all the world like a plesiosaur. It's just amazing how appropriate that is. Uh, they say it's uh, 20 to 30 feet in length with two pairs uh, of flippers and a serpent-like neck. And that does match. And again, that's their painting of it. So you can, you can judge for yourself whether that looks like a plesiosaur. I think it does. There are legends of a creature that, um, from the African Congo that the natives there, call it, they call it Mokeli Mbembe. That's their name for it. And eyewitness reports are as recent as 1990, and then they stop. So they, uh, they claim this creature kills elephants. So whatever it is, it's, it's massive. And um, if you show them a, a, a depiction of a sauropod dinosaur, a long neck, long tailed dinosaur like that, they'll say, Mokele and Bembe. If you show them a picture of a bear, they'll say, we don't know, right? So they're not making it up. They've seen something that looks kind of like that. So pretty neat. And it's just, it's amazing to me that, you know, 1990, wow, that's within my lifetime. And it, and, it, and it may now be extinct because there haven't been any more eyewitness reports since 1990. Now again, we don't know for sure. Nobody's got a picture of it. Uh, there have been people that have apparently recorded the sound of the creature, which is uh, kind of a neat idea, but in any case. But there are things that are, from a scientific standpoint, just as amazing and confirmatory of creation. For example, the Wallamai pine. The Wallamai pine tree is uh, found in the same uh, rock layers as dinosaurs and not above. And so secularists thought that this thing had been extinct for millions and millions of years. And yet in 1994, they found some of these still growing in certain places in Australia. Now they were fairly remote locations, but they've now found at least three locations in Australia where you'll find Wallamai pines still growing. Isn't that interesting? They said it's like finding a living dinosaur because they thought they'd been extinct millions of years ago. But there they are and they look just like they do in the fossil record. How about that? You can think of it as a dinosaur tree. I think that's interesting because it's not like a tree can run away and hide, and yet it evaded our detection until 1994. That kind of makes me wonder if there might be some critters out there that we haven't discovered yet. We do discover new creatures every now and then. It makes me wonder if maybe some dinosaurs might have evaded our detection. But most of them, and perhaps all of them, have died, and that brings up the question then, why is it that we don't have dinosaurs anymore? Why did they die? And it's not just the dinosaurs, by the way. We tend to focus on them because they're exciting. And, you know, they, they, they're the ones that people like to make movies about, right? You don't see a whole lot of movies about trilobites, but they, they were around too. Trilobites are these, like these little, you know, like those little pill bugs? I don't know if you have them here, but they kind of roll up into a, when you touch them, they roll up into a little ball. And, uh, well, trilobites were like that, except they lived in the ocean. And some of them, some of them got pretty big, but most of them were pretty small. There are fossils of trilobites everywhere. You go to Ohio, you dig anywhere, you'll see trilobite fossils. They're, they're all over the place. And yet today, as far as we know, there's not a trilobite left on earth anywhere. They're extinct. How did that happen? Lots of creatures have gone extinct. Mammoths aren't around anymore. Giant ground sloths are not around anymore, although tree sloths are still around. There's lots of reasons why things go extinct, including the dinosaurs. Disease comes through and wipes them out. They can't handle it. Maybe other species can and they survive. Famine comes through and wipes them out. Other species either are able to get to a new location or they're able to eat different types of plants and they survive. Some animals have been hunted to extinction. You read all these legends about people going out and slaying dragons, maybe we killed them off. That's entirely plausible. In any case, the ultimate reason why dinosaurs and everything else that's gone extinct has died is because of sin. That's really the ultimate reason, because Adam rebelled against God. And that, that broke the earth. God cursed the earth as the right punishment, part of the right punishment for Adam's sin. Animals now suffer and die. And we suffer and die because of that original sin. And so when you, when you see these dinosaur fossils, it's a reminder, this is what sin does. Sin brings death. And that's right, it should, because you're, you're rebelling against, you're rejecting the God of life. Of course you're choosing death. It, that makes perfect sense. And frankly, we think most of these dinosaur fossils that we find, probably either all of them or almost all of them are from the flood. There might have been a few afterwards, but uh, most of those fossils are from that worldwide flood. And so that is evidence that God judges sin. He's done it before with water, 
He's going to do it again by fire. Are you ready? You can use dinosaur fossils to point people to the biblical God and say, hey, God is a righteous God. He judges sin. This is evidence of it. And the fact that these creatures aren't around anymore, that shows that death is the penalty for sin. If Adam had never rebelled against God and, and no one else had, we'd still have dinosaurs today and they would still be peaceful creatures. You can summarize dinosaur history in the five F's. We talked about the seven C's. Here's the five F's of dinosaurs. They were formed. They were created on day six uh, because they're land animals. What about the, the flying reptiles and the swimming reptiles? They're made on day five, according to scripture, just one day earlier. But the true dinosaurs would have been made on day six, and they would have been vegetarian originally because all creatures were vegetarian originally and human beings as well. Fallen. Dinosaurs fell when we did. When Adam rebelled against God, God cursed the world, and everything that was under Adam's dominion was cursed as well, and that includes uh, the dinosaurs. And maybe some of them became meat-eating at that point, or perhaps later, we don't really know. But, but in any case, um, then there was the flood, and this is where the wickedness of mankind became great, and God, being a righteous God, judges sin, so of course he's going to do that. And we think that just about all the dinosaur fossils we find today are from that flood year. And that explains their ordering based on how, where they lived and, and how mobile they were and so on. So, yeah, so that we find, the fact that you find fossils at all is evidence of a flood. Most things don't fossilize when they die. They just decay. They're recycled in the environment. You have to cover something in sediment to get it to fossilize. And that, flood conditions are ideal for that. Then dinosaurs faded. They faded from existence. They faded from history. We think the conditions after the flood were not exactly the same as the conditions before, and so maybe dinosaurs didn't do as well in that, um, in that post-flood world, and so they gradually diminished, although some of them apparently fairly recently. And then as uh, stories are told from one generation to the next, if they're not written down immediately, they can be embellished, and so maybe that's where we get our modern idea of what a dragon is. We kind of combine the different varieties of dinosaur. And then finally dinosaurs were found. They were rediscovered in the 1800s. That's when we first started finding fossils of these creatures and we realized there were some creatures on this planet that we've forgotten about. Things that we didn't know about. So the secular world uses dinosaurs to tell stories about evolution, especially with kids. Yeah. And, and it's, I'm amazed at how young they start. Because I get, you know, I travel a lot and I get to see, you know, the different programs on the airplane and, and sometimes the children's program's on. There's one called Dinosaur Train, something like that. And it's clearly for little kids. And they're already saying, okay, now this dinosaur then evolved into this one over millions of years. And I'm thinking, wow, they're hitting them early. They're trying to get your kids to believe in evolution very, very early. We need to remember that Christians are not the only fishers of men. In, in the same way, the secular world uses fictional stories about dinosaurs to try and convince people of evolution. We can use the facts about dinosaurs, the truth about them, to show people that God's word is true from the beginning, to train people to view our world through biblical glasses, to show people the evidence that lines up with scripture. And it always does if you understand it. And that's what we're about at the Biblical Science Institute. We want to reconnect the Bible to the real world. People have this impression that the Bible is just a collection of interesting moral stories, it has that aspect, but it's much more than that. It's true. It's real history. And that's, the morality comes out of that, of course. So that's what we want to do. And we want people to be saved as a result of that. What better use of dinosaurs than to lead people to the gospel? I think that's a great use for it. And you know, when I learned this information, I was probably in college when I learned much of what I'm sharing with you now. And it really kind of re-energized my faith. I was already a believer, but I'm like, oh, this makes so much sense. And it got me back, digging back into the scriptures. What other gems have I missed? There's a lot of good stuff in there. And, and you know, sharing this with, with youngsters, this is a great topic for youngsters because youngsters like dinosaurs. And it might be a great way to get them to searching through the scriptures and it's never too young to, to start that activity. So uh, this presentation, we have that available on DVD, Dinosaurs in the Bible. But some of the other resources, I'll mention a few of these briefly. The Ultimate Proof of Creation, this is the one that um, gives you a bulletproof argument for biblical creation. I'm actually going to talk about that in the final session tomorrow if you're able to come and hear that. But if not, there's the book, Taking Back Astronomy, uh, showing how the universe declares God's glory, not billions of years or a big bang. 
A Stargazer's Guide to the Night Sky, How to Better Enjoy the Night Sky from a Christian Perspective. That's a fun resource. Don't forget about our, our uh, book pack, 20% discounted, tw best of our books. Our DVD pack, again, 20% discounted. Or our library pack, 30% discounted. Only available here, today and tomorrow, if you come back tomorrow. Uh, we don't do the packs over the website. Uh, children's resources. A I highly recommend the one in the middle there, Answers for Kids. That's just a wonderful, wonderful book pack. Uh, get them all. They're colorful, they're, uh, and they, they give really concise and yet theologically and scientifically accurate answers to questions that kids have, like where did God come from and where did Cain get his wife and did Adam and Eve have belly buttons and uh, was there an ice age and what about continental drift and things like that. So do check those out. Don't forget to sign up for our free monthly newsletter. Yes, put your email address there. You'll get that around the 15th of the month is when that comes out. And do check us out on the web as well, biblicalscienceinstitute.com. Thank you very much. God bless. All right. Well, wasn't that awesome? All right. Hey, and if you guys got time in the morning, 8.30 uh, a.m. in this room, we would love to see you all here. But let's just go ahead and close in prayer. Lord, we are so thankful, Lord, for this presentation, Lord God, that is strengthening our faith, and Lord God, just seeing all the great things you've made, and, and just how, um, Lord, how, what, what the world does to lie to us, Lord God, we're so thankful for just encouraging things like, like the uh, Biblical Science Institute, for Jason Lyle, for, for all the books and stuff that he has put out, Lord God, we just pray right now, Lord God, that you would just bless him tremendously, and Lord God, that you would just carry on that, that ministry of truth. In Jesus' name, we all said... Amen. Again, I want to encourage you. We're going to do one more song, but I want to encourage you, don't leave without going back and, and, and looking at everything and, and just seeing what he has because it, it's pretty awesome, right? Amen? Yeah. All right. God bless you guys.